Where does this leave the BBC? Uh, severely injured, uh, probably scarred. Well, we did ask the BBC to join us, but nobody was available. Tonight, the story... This is the BBC in crisis mode, reporting on itself and a scandal of its own making. At the centre, Martin Bashir, the forged bank documents that he used to get close to the Princess of Wales and the botched investigation by BBC bosses that followed. Then, late last night, more condemnation, this time from the future monarch. She was failed not just by a rogue reporter, but by leaders at the BBC who looked the other way rather than asking the tough questions. So how did we get here? It began with the infamous Diana interview. A year later, an internal investigation cleared him of any wrongdoing. He then left the BBC for ITV, producing another bombshell interview, this time with Michael Jackson. Then in 2016, Mr Bashir was rehired by the BBC. At the time, the then head of news gathering praised his track record in enterprising journalism, saying he was respected in the industry. In 2020, more damaging details of how Mr Bashir obtained his breakthrough interview emerged in a Channel 4 investigation. Six months later, he resigned due to ill health, just days ahead of the publication of the Lord Dyson report. Since Lord Dyson's report was released yesterday, there's been a lot of what you might describe as self-flagellation from the BBC. But when it comes to those at the very top of the organisation, there are still many questions left unanswered. Why was Mr Bashir rehired in 2016? Were the allegations surrounding him taken into account at the time? And which senior figures signed off that appointment? We've put all this to the BBC and we've repeatedly asked for an interview with the Director General, Tim Davey. So far, we haven't had any answers. The former director of BBC News said today that it was his decision, but was less clear on who else was involved. So the question of exactly who said what to whom, you know, journalistically, I would ask exactly the same question. The way I look, look at this and the way I think about it is that I was running BBC News when Martin Bashir was hired back into BBC News, and so the responsibility for that sits with me. We also asked ITV if they had confidence in the interviews Mr Bashir conducted whilst he worked there. They have yet to respond. So what now for the BBC? With its reputation damaged, could political reform be coming? I can only imagine the feelings of the, of the royal family and uh, I hope very much that the BBC will be taking every possible step to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. Could this be a moment when those people in the Conservative Party that don't particularly like the BBC, decide that they can now take it on? The BBC has its critics, and some of them are indeed uh, Conservatives. And, of course, critics of the BBC would take advantage when the BBC stumbles as badly as it has done. But I would say quite genuinely that the idea that there's a sort of government conspiracy to get rid of the BBC is really very wide of the mark. A report by MPs released today has also criticised the organisation for failing to face up to the difficult financial decisions it needs to make to ensure its future. And with a government review of how it's run coming up next year, there could still be more dark days ahead for the BBC. Well, the television executive Pat Young worked in the BBC's News and Current Affairs Department at the time the Diana interview was broadcast. He now chairs a new campaign to protect public service broadcasting, and he joins me now. Um, Pat Young, thank you for coming on to the programme. Give us a sense of what it was like at the BBC in the immediate aftermath of, of Martin Bashir's interview airing. Well, the, the, the interview was a coup, wasn't it? It was a, a journalistic coup, or it was considered to be a journalistic coup at the time. And, um, you know, and the story made waves. So at the time, um, everybody thought that it was, uh, you know, and, it, and everybody thought at the time it was an incredible piece of television. Now, we've had a judge-led inquiry that tells us that some of the things that led up to that interview um, were, were, were uh, improper. Mm. But at the time, it was, a, it was a great interview. How do you make sense of the subsequent cover-up and everything we have learned in the Lord Dyson report? Well, I, I the word cover-up is one. I'm not sure that Dyson uses it. Um, it's a devastating report for the BBC, not just the actions of Martin Bashir, um, but also the failure of the management to investigate that properly. And also, it's been devastating for some of the individuals like Matt Wiesler who were caught up in it. 
Um, I would also say that unlike scandals elsewhere, the BBC did commission an independent report into its own behaviour. It published it in full. It apologised unreservedly and immediately. And as we've all seen for today, at least it's given over its airways to its critics, both internal and external. And no one else would do that. So I think we sort of seen the worst and the best of the BBC all in one story. Yeah, we're certainly hearing a lot of BBC on BBC action. Um, but just in terms of Prince William coming out and making an incredibly scathing statement, that's quite an extraordinary situation. You've got a future monarch here who's raised serious concerns about the public, the public service broadcaster. What do you think that means? It is serious, um, uh, but Prince Harry also said and, uh, then and now it's bigger than one outlet, one network and one publication. And I think he's right. Um, we've got to get a sense of proportion into all of this. The BBC is not Panorama. The BBC is not Martin Bashir and a failed management group. The BBC is television, it's news, it's children's programmes, it's national and regional broadcasting, it's sport, it's radio, it's world service. And so I think we need to get a sense of proportion in all of this. Yes, something terrible happened. It happened within one show. And even within that show, it was a very small group of people that were involved. And to condemn the work of tens of thousands of BBC employees... Uh, who are working for the public good, okay. I think is mistaken. But, but you know very well ministers, some ministers are already talking about restructuring the BBC. There is chatter about reforms. Certainly some Conservative backbenchers have made uh, louder noises. It's going to be very difficult to defend the BBC, isn't it? No, it's very easy to defend the BBC. These people, those people that want to destroy the BBC will want to destroy it anyway. They didn't need this uh, as the as a as a weapon. I mean, the BBC have given them a stick to beat them with. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, when we had the phone hacking scandal, uh, no one said abolish the newspapers after the phone hacking scandal. And in fact, when we argued for more regulation of the newspapers, the newspapers said that more regulation wasn't the answer and they should be left to improve their own system of self-regulation. Well, the BBC board and trust have already gone. They've been replaced by a new regulator in Ofcom. The BBC has a new leader. So okay. I think that the BBC is well placed to carry on. Let, let me very quickly put to you, though, just today, the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament has said that the BBC is failing to meet the challenges of the future in terms of the financial and commercial challenges, and that it is a titanic organisation rearranging its deck chairs. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's very flowery language. I mean, the fundamental financial issue that the BBC faces is that they can't get a decision from the government about what to do about the decriminalisation of the licence fee. And if they had a decision on that, they'll be able to do other things. So it's very easy to put all of these complaints at the BBC's door, but you know, there are other people involved as well. OK, Pat Young, thanks very much for joining us.